Hey guys, uh, I'm Ted. Welcome back to our lecture series. And for today's lecture, we're going to uh, discuss the end of the United States Civil War. We're going to discuss the later war years. But before we do that, I'd like to touch back on uh, on a few of the things that we just, that we uh, discussed on on our very long covering of the home front of the United States Civil War. Uh, and so one of the things that we discussed was slavery's evolution. Slavery went from being uh, a relationship in which all, basically all of the power was held by the slave owners to this sort of uh, new understanding that uh, in areas where the uh, United States Army wasn't, uh, wasn't on hand, things would go on as usual, but with so many of the young... Uh, and knowledgeable uh, white male population of the Confederate States gone, uh, it was really, really uh, increasingly difficult for those who remained behind to exercise the, the same amount of control, control to the same degree over the African American community, over the slave community that they had before. Uh, this enabled slaves to simply pick up and leave. It enabled uh, individual slaves or slave families to run away and be harbored on plantations and farms had they made their way to the United States Army uh, camps and lines. Um, we also uh, examined the uh, the amendment, the Thirteenth Amendment, the amendment that abolished slavery. That came uh, that that took effect, um, and it had uh, profound effects on the home front. Um, the phenomenon contraband slave uh, that I alluded to earlier with uh, slavery's evolution, slaves slave just running away. The United States Army appeared. Um, slaves made it to the camps. They sort of pushed um, the United States government to come to a, a full settlement regarding slavery and uh, the presence of these slaves, of these uh, contraband, these uh, formerly enslaved persons who took it upon themselves to self-emancipate. Uh, and also we looked at African-American uh, soldiers. Um, those who uh, petitioned outright from the beginning of the war for their inclusion in the war, the uh, the impact and uh, what it really meant for them to serve. It gave them a direct hand in uh, killing slavery and ending slavery in the United States. It also helped them to, it also helped them to uh, build a uh, an ironclad case for citizenship after the war. Okay, and now with all that being said, let's dive right into the conclusion of the United States Civil War. Uh, so we last left off in, uh, in our discussion on the uh, strict battle narrative of the United States Civil War. We last left off uh, with battlefield events after the summer of 1863. The United States had achieved some great successes, but the outcome of the war was still uncertain. Following the Battle of Chattanooga, Grant was brought uh, east. He was brought to command... Uh, the Army of the Potomac in the Eastern Theater and to square off directly against Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. Now Grant wanted to press the Confederate States to their limits. He wanted to apply pressure across the board and to expose the weaknesses of the Confederate government, the Confederate States. Now Grant's plan, uh, the final uh, United States battle strategy rested on Grant taking the Army of the Potomac and battling away uh, the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, while, while all of this was, uh, was taking place, uh, Sherman, Sherman was to take uh, 100,000 men and push towards Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta was at this point the last great inland city in the Confederate States. Uh, Nashville had fallen um, Nashville had fallen, uh, what's it, um, New Orleans had fallen, it, it, it was, it was that last great hub, um, there were rail junctions in Atlanta, very, uh, well-developed industries in Atlanta, uh, in Atlanta, a lot of the, a lot of the industrial output, uh, was being put, was being sent out from Atlanta, uh, also around Atlanta was, uh, a lot of the, uh, the rich, agricultural land. You could break Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta was uh, the linchpin between the um, the deep south, uh, the, the deep um, counties, the rich land counties of Mississippi and Alabama, and then of course um, the, the linchpin through, through which Georgia served to unite uh, 
South Carolina, North Carolina, and Southern Virginia. Uh, so Atlanta was a major, major spot, a major, major destination. It was uh, it was major on the uh, the list to break uh, the Confederacy from within. So Sherman is pushing uh, towards Atlanta, destroying everything from the south, and uh, and and Sherman, Sherman was going through there, and he was going to destroy, strike at that productive hinterland of the Confederate States, destroying the Confederate uh, their, their ability to mount any sort of resistance, burning all the crops, slaughtering livestock, tearing up the rail lines, and of course destroying those industrial buildings. Now Sherman was a very firm advocate of this kind of total war. Uh, many people look towards William Sherman as being the first modern general. And there is a lot of controversy surrounding uh, William Sherman. Uh, he is still reviled for his actions um, for uh, uh, which included inflicting such hardships on the European American civilian population of the Confederate States. Um, Sherman defended his actions and his, uh, his supporters still defend his actions as being the more humane option. And Sherman himself said that destroying the livestock uh, and the crops, uh, that, that was a better uh, alternative to seeking battle and killing the men. Um, there were high expectations for Grant and for Sherman. They were both seen as this dynamic duo that would lead the United States to military glory and victory over the Confederate States. Now, in the Confederate States, there were a there was a nuanced optimism in the face of their recent string of defeats. Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Chattanooga hung over their head, but they maintained an unshakable belief that the Army of Northern Virginia, commanded by Robert E. Lee, would lead them to victory. Uh, as I stated in our previous lectures, Lee became the uh, the living heartbeat of the Confederate States. Um, as soon as the, can, uh, as the campaign season began, morale in the United States fell sharply, uh, particularly in the spring and early summer of 1864. Uh, Sherman began his campaign well. He left Chattanooga and steadily moved towards Atlanta. He made good time. Uh, he made it to Atlanta and laid siege to the city um, by, uh, by July of 1864. He encountered no major opposition and fought no major battles along the way. Uh, people were unsatisfied that they, uh, what, what, what they expected to be um, just an easy capture of Atlanta as soon as he uh, arrived. Um, there, there were Confederate field operatives in the way. Uh, Joseph Johnston had been there and Joseph Johnston had been uh, fighting him. Joseph Johnston had been doing a pretty good job. Johnston did not have the troops to meet Sherman and to battle Sherman head on. Johnston uh, did all he could to delay Sherman's advance, and he harassed uh, Sherman's supply lines. That was uh, that was Johnston's uh, best uh, best plan, and it worked pretty good. Um, uh, it, it worked pretty good. He he was just enough of a nuisance to where Sherman had to um, leave more and more of his army to guide uh, to guide and guard his supply lines. Um, he sort of he uh, sort of had to whittle away his army, whittle away his army, whittle away his army, as he made his way to Atlanta. Uh, but with, with all that said, he still made good time, and he still managed to lay siege to Atlanta. Um, Grant uh, Grant's campaign in uh, Virginia was disappointing as well. Over six weeks, U.S. Grant and Robert E. Lee met in a series of big and bloody battles. Uh, the battles between Lee and Grant were the biggest and the bloodiest of the entire war. And uh, the populations of the United States and the Confederate States, uh, as well as the world, had really gotten used to hearing about these big bloody battles. Uh, but, but these battles were just the largest and the, and the most catastrophic that the United States had ever seen up until that point. Um, Every uh, every few days, uh, uh, it, it really it was really jarring to off to the observers. Um, there were there there was an almost uh, daily list of casualties coming from the field, uh, the battlefield. Every co uh, every couple of days, the two armies smacked into each other um, for for major battles. But there were con but there was continual fighting. Um, with major actions, you know, as I said, every couple of days. 
the pattern before this, be, 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 before those two went started going head to head, the pattern before this was there'd be a big battle, then a long period of inactivity will follow before another battle will take place. There was a healing process to this. Um, uh, Grant would have none of that. Grant would not ease up. If he lost, he would still move towards Richmond. He won, he would still move towards Richmond. Grant was just moving, moving, moving. Uh, to illustrate just how costly this campaign was, the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac averaged 3,000 casualties a day over a six-week period. The Army of the Potomac went into the campaign at 120,000 uh, troops. That, that's how many troops Grant had at his disposal. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia uh, had 65,000 troops. By the time Grant reached Petersburg, which is right outside of Richmond, uh, both armies had over 100,000 casualties. Uh, both armies had lost over half of their fighting strength. This was an enormous cost to bear, especially for Lee. Grant's opponents, uh, mainly mainly the uh, Copperhead Democrats, began to call him Grant the Butcher or the Butcher Grant. Uh, Grant hated that nickname, but he was doing exactly what he wanted to do. Uh, he realized that Lee was too wily of a commander. Lee was too audacious. He could not try to match Lee the way uh, the way Hooker or Burnside or uh, or or um, uh, or any of the other commanders, uh, Hooker, Burnside, um, McClellan, uh, Pope. Uh, he could not try to, to to match them the way Lee, uh, the the way um, uh, the the way the way they approached Lee. He had to uh, he had to stick to his battle plan. He realized that that Lee would old tactician him. He gave that to Lee, but he said but he be under, he understood that Lee could not get the reinforcements that he had, and also Lee could never hope to get an army over eighty thousand men uh, at at its height. The Army of Northern Virginia had 75,000 men. Uh, Lee could never hope to get that many men. Uh, so, so he realized that just keep pressing, keep pressing, keep pressing. Battle him, battle him, battle him. Sooner or later, he'd catch Lee and he'd be able to break Lee's army in a battle. And he would just keep moving and moving and moving. He realized that no matter what, Lee would have to put his army in between the Army of the Potomac and the Army of uh, and, and, and the city of Richmond, at all costs, Lee would have to fight them. Uh, and if he kept pressing towards uh, Richmond, Lee would continue have would, would uh, always have to throw his army in uh, in front of him. So, so he's doing what he wants to do. He's bleeding uh, the Army of Northern Virginia dry. Uh, but the events of Virginia and, and the events in Georgia brought the United States war morale to its lowest point during the war. There was a great danger that Lincoln was going to lose the election and that the United States would give up on the war. The Confederates on the other side were gaining momentum. Uh, they were fully aware. They were fully aware that the United States um, was, uh, was, was losing interest. They were fully aware of what was happening in the United States. Um, uh, and they were also aware that while the northern uh, the uh, the Army of Northern Virginia was being was being bled dry, it had not been defeated. Uh, they they always posited to that the Army of Northern Virginia had not been defeated. Um, now the tide turned decisively in favor of the United States uh, in August when Mobile was captured by Admiral David Farragut in one of the most dramatic episodes of the war. Uh, the 60-year-old Farragut had uh, took his flagship, the USS Hartford, and torpedoed through Confederate defenses, which included a minefield. It was uh, the minefield was a uh, an area, a, a stretch of water uh, in between uh, the deep sea, deep water, blue water, and uh, the coastal water, just outside the harbor, uh, had a defensive measure. It was a, a field of explosives, and one United States ship had hit one and had been sunk. Um, Farragut uh, said some very strong, colorful language, and steamed straight ahead, steaming all the way through it, 
and attacking the city directly. Uh, Farragut did that. The rest of the fleet that he was in command of did that. And they took Mobile. Uh, Mobile fell. Um, the capture of uh, Mobile was uh, what was was um, was followed very quickly. Uh, two weeks later, really, by Sherman's eventual capture of Atlanta, and this was critical. Atlanta uh, thrilled audiences in the United States. Um, part of the plan was working. Uh, just had news of Atlanta hit news that Philip Sheridan had uh, had uh, had um was on a, had a, had attained a series of victories in the Shenandoah Valley hit as well. These are three big victories, three big events in the summer of 1864. They propel the Republicans and Abraham Lincoln uh, to victory in the elections of 1864. Now the war is still not over at this point. In November of 1864, Sherman struck out across northern uh, Georgia on his in-country march to the sea. He cut a 60 mile wide swath of destruction uh, through Georgia um, on its way to, uh, on its way from Atlanta to Savannah. Sherman's army marched through the heartland of the Confederate States with no opposition. There was nothing that they could do about it. Uh, he turned north after Savannah and marched through South Carolina. He especially dealt a heavy hand, an even heavier blow, to South Carolina. Uh, and, and South Carolina was blamed for starting the war. So this explains why, why he, he and his soldiers were so hard on South Carolina. He continued on until he reached, uh, until he got to right, uh, right, right, uh, right to what is uh, now Durham, Durham, North Carolina. Now, uh, Grant and Lee... All this time were grinding away at each other. Uh, Lee was bested by Grant, and he was actually for Lee was eventually bested by Grant, and he was forced to abandon Petersburg. The withdrawal of Lee from Petersburg left Richmond exposed, and the Confederate government abandoned its capital on April 2nd, 1865. Now Grant had finally captured Richmond. Lee attempted to escape to the west. He wanted to arc down around Grant to unite with units in North Carolina, but Grant paralleled his movements, uh, preventing him from doing so, compelling Lee to ask Grant for terms of his surrender. Uh, in Wilmer McLean's parlor, the two met and Lee formally surrendered to Grant on April 9th, 1865. The Army of Northern Virginia surrender marked the effective end of the war for all practical purposes. Uh, there were still Confederate units in the field, but they too surrendered in the, in the coming days. Um, Johnston, William E. Johnston, came up to uh, came up to offer his surrender. Uh, he came up to offer his surrender to uh, Sherman. Braxton Bragg also uh, offered his surrender. To all these different units. All the different Confederate land units offered their surrender. The war quickly ended. Texas held out. Texas held out uh, the longest, but all the other states um, uh, gave up. Texas would uh, would hold out until the summer of 1865. But for all practical purposes, April 9th would, uh, would Lee surrender to Grant. Uh, the defeat of the Army of Northern Virginia marked the end of the war. Now, Abraham Lincoln did not live long enough to savor the victory on uh we um the the official collapse of the confederacy is listed as uh the 11th uh the 11th of april is the uh, the official date um that that's when the uh, the government formally uh formally gave up uh that that's when everything collapsed um uh Lincoln, um, on Friday, April 14th, uh, the president uh, took the first lady to see the comedy Our American Cousins at Ford Theater in Washington. Uh, Lincoln, at the time, was 56 years old, and he was thoroughly worn out by his presidency. Um, it, it's really striking when you look at pictures of Lincoln before he was president and after he was president. I mean, every president um, had that aging effect, but it was really 
really bad on Lincoln. We all can see why. The civil, it was a tremendous endeavor, tremendous thing for him to uh, endure, being the president in the midst of a civil war. Um, but Lincoln was 56. He was worn out, uh, aged greatly by the war, um, and, and and he was at the time still focusing on his duties as president. He was coming up with a reconstruction plan for the republic. Uh, as he entered the presidential box and took his seat and began to walk the play, John Wilkes Booth, a Confederate sympathizer uh, who who had uh, really been rooting for the Confederacy and wanted the Confederacy to win, but he didn't really want the Confeder he didn't want the Confederacy to win bad enough to have enlisted and fought for the Confederacy, um, snuck into his box and he shot the president. Um, he wa he. He was not man enough to, or courageous enough to actually go and fight for the Confederacy, but he was willing to murder the President of the United States of the United States for the uh, for the presidency. Uh, he snuck in, he shot Lincoln in the back of the head, and then he leapt down uh, from the presidential box onto uh, onto the stage. Had he leapt, his uh, his riding spur caught on on on, uh, on the draping or. Or the uh, or trappings uh, on the stage, and he ended up breaking his leg. Uh, had had he landed, um, had he uh, had he uh, landed on the stage, he shouted the Virginia State motto: "Sic semper tyrannis." Thus always to tyrants. Um, it's a uh, a tongue-in-cheek reference to Lincoln. Uh, one of the names for the Civil War is, uh, a couple of the names actually are uh, Mr. Lincoln's War and the Tyrant's War. The Tyrant being Lincoln. Uh, and, and Six Semper Tyrannus uh, refers to the Tyrant. He gave the Tyrant what the Tyrant always gets um, before he hobbled away. Um, Lincoln was carried across the street to the P uh, Peterson House. Uh, he never regained consciousness and he died the next day, uh, 7 o'clock, uh, 7 a.m. the next day on April 15th, the president died and the United States were plunged into mourning. Um, Jefferson Davis and ex-Confederate leaders in general were blamed for the assassination plot. There was a new swelling of hard feelings towards the rebel slave states. In the United States, um, Booth was hunted down and he was killed. He was shot in a burning barn. Uh, with four of his co-conspirators. Uh, four others were hung in connection with the assassination plot anyway, including um, including the uh, the landlady uh, of the, uh, the the lady who uh, owned the boarding house in which the men uh, met and conspired to to, to commit their plot. Uh, she almost certainly did not didn't know what was happening in in her home, but she nonetheless was punished along with those men. Um, uh, for uh, 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 there, there were other plots as well. Um, it wasn't just Lincoln. Did this was a uh, they they had planned to assassinate to murder the leaders of the United States government. Um, they had planned on also murdering the vice president of the United States, the Tennessee Unionist Andrew Johnson, who became the 17th president of the United States following Lincoln's murder. Uh, they also planned to kill. Uh, the sitting Secretary of State, William H. Seward. Seward was saved uh, because of his son. His son actually saved his life. And Johnson was saved by other quick-acting individuals as well. Um, but, but yeah, but they, 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 this was a full-on plot to murder the leaders of the United States. Uh, the war was enormous. Um, the cost of the war was enormous. Uh, it frequently cited that more people died in the United States Civil War than in all the other wars combined, from the colonial wars up to Vietnam. Uh, up until 2003, there was still a surviving widow, a widow of a Civil War veteran collecting a pension, uh, collecting pension benefits, and at least one child of a Civil War veteran still alive, still alive now, Irene Triplett.
uh, as of 2000 and, uh, 2013, Irene Triplett was still alive. I haven't saw, I wasn't able to find anything else on her, but Irene Triplett was still alive in 2013 collecting survivor benefits from the Civil War. Uh, in both of those instances, in a lot of these instances, you had the situation of very old men marrying very young women. Um... But but we but we still but we but we are still calculating the cost of the United States Civil War more than 150 years after its conclusion. So so that just goes to show that that's a little added on to what's happening there uh, to 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 the cost of the war, and also how relevant the war still is in many ways. Um, not many people can say that my father fought in you know a war that ended over a hundred and something years ago. Uh, so we still uh, do not have that full ca uh, calculation but to give a little perspective the United States uh, the United States um, federal budget left from 64 million in 1860 to 1.3 billion in 1865 the Confederate States uh, it's really hard to, um, uh, to calculate the Confederate States it's hard to ascertain but you can conservatively estimate that the cost, uh, the cost of the war was it, it is somewhere between 1.5 billion and 3.5 billion, uh, and the post-war cost um, cause, causes that number to rise. Has many Confederate states instituted a pension benefit system for their war veterans? Now, one of the uh, one of the main drawback, one of the main uh, effects, consequences of the Civil War was the destruction of the former confederate states um it, it, it would just it was just unbelievable the comparison is that between uh them and the uh the comparison made is to compare the confederate states in 1865 with the european nations uh between the two world wars uh from 1919 up until 1945 uh it was a period of uh intense um, slide uh, an intense decline and dramatic destruction uh, to, to, to go from 1914 to 1945 Europe uh, a very affluent society a society on the rise uh, in the eyes of many and then in 1945 it was more clear that it was a society on the decline and one that had seen major and serious deprivations um, uh, it's uh, the the evidence uh, we, we look at the region and we see that uh, the, the the former slave states uh, those core regions of the Confederate states lost two-thirds of their wealth of their regional wealth was lost now much of that was in land and slave holdings um, the slave holdings really made up the bulk of that wealth but about one-third of all the men who uh, who um, fought in that war died you have uh, one-fourth of the men dying um, and about two-fifths of of all the livestock uh, well no no no, no. it's um, two-fifth to one-third of all the livestock uh, was lost uh, that includes horses mules cows pigs uh, sheep all the all those things, and most of those things coming through Sherman's march to the sea, but uh, but still a, a, a tremendous loss in uh, in, a, in all that the farming equipment, rail lines, industrial buildings, all that destroyed. Uh, in contrast, by 1870, the Northeast saw a growth of over 50 percent in their wealth, uh, and there was also a very visible increase in wealth in the West too. Um, so the war had a very visible effect on those who experienced it. Uh, the United States was made indivisible by the war. The states occupied a secondary place to the central government. And the central government, or the federal government, now began an unprecedented growth in power. All of the questions left over from the Constitutional Convention were decisively answered. Uh, no more would those questions plague the United States. Uh, the same way they had done um, during the... Uh, the, the years of the early republic. The war left unresolved how the new freedmen
um, uh, uh, the, the recently uh, emancipated slaves, as they were called, uh, it, it let them resolve how the freedmen were going to fit into the republic and how the former rebel slave states were going to be brought back into the republic. Those would be questions that we would uh, that we would get to the answers of in our next uh, lectures. Uh, but, um, but but that concludes our lecture on the United States Civil War. Thank you for uh, viewing, for watching. Uh, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you guys thought about my presentation on the Civil War. Um, I'll see you guys next time for another lecture. And as always, I'm Ted.